It's Paul Joseph Watson with Infowars.com. We're talking to geopolitical analyst and Syrian activist Mimi Alaham, otherwise known as Syrian Girl. Syrian Girl, welcome to the show. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. Now, of course, over the past month, we've seen ISIS jihadists completely overrun the Iraqi military in many areas of the country. They've stolen this huge arsenal of military vehicles, weapons, including Stinger missiles. They've got chemical weapons. They've seized towns, committed atrocities, and now they're destroying mosques. So where did this group come from? Who's responsible for its expansion and how did it become so powerful? Well, actually, ISIS was formed in Iraq in 2007. It's uh, one of its captured leaders, in fact, admitted that for the first year of its life, it solely existed on the Internet. But that didn't stop most of the foreign media, especially Al Jazeera, Qatar's satellite TV station, from promoting their existence. Um, the group was basically designed to crush any unity between Sunnis and Shias in Iraq so that uh, the resistance would be divided and conquered, basically. Even, you know, in, in, in 2003, we were then told that Iraq had Al-Qaeda already in it, that Al-Qaeda was operating in Iraq, but as we know, that was in fact a lie. Uh, there was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq until the U.S. brought it there after the invasion. Um, we were told in 2004 that Abu Musab al-Zarqawi was in Fallujah, even though no one had actually ever seen him there, and any Fallujah that was interviewed at the time said he's, he's, he's never made an appearance, and he's very much like a WMD. Abu Musab al-Zarqawi was the then leader of al-Qaeda, which at the time didn't have the name ISIS or ISI or IS. Um, so they referred to him as another WMD, basically something that is an invention just to create a pretext for war. Um, and that it was only by 2006 that this IS or ISIS group emerged and pre-existing factions in Iraq, which were resistance movement that were loosely unified um, but were more nationalist leaning, took ISIS in fact to be a threat and at the beginning clashed with it. But ISIS proved too strong to squash. And that brings us to the question, why has ISIS emerged as the most powerful of all the groups? And you have to ask, first of all, is it possible that this could happen without a state backer? You know, uh, I think that, in my opinion, it is not. Um, I think that there's definitely an organization that is backing this, this ISIS group. And if we look at who benefits the most, um, the introduction of the Maliki government after the fall of Iraq uh, basically handed Iraq to Iran's influence. So it was largely influenced by um, a sort of an unholy alliance between the U.S. and Iraq and Iran, excuse me, at the time. And now that this influence has overtaken the U.S.s in the region. Um, the obvious uh, beneficiaries for the Maliki government to be destabilized and weakened and Iranian influence to be weakened also are the usual suspects, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the United States and Israel. Um, Clinton, in fact, recently called for Maliki to step down. Now, at the worst possible time to do so, so it, it is basically siding alongside ISIS. Um, However, you know, in spite of all of this, I don't actually believe that ISIS is as powerful as the media is making them out to be, because they have a perception of invincibility, and that perception of invincibility is creating more members and more people being recruited, because the, of the lack of clarity behind who is backing this group, it's, it's driving easily manipulated youths into actually believing that ISIS is backed by God. Like, that must be the secret to its strengths. And, you know, finally, ISIS has a sort of, you're either with us or against us policy. There's no middle ground with these people. They rule with fear and barbarism. So uh, even if, if the sheikhs may secretly give them money, they, unless they publicly support, state their support for ISIS, ISIS considers them enemies. And out of fear, actually, they get many defections. So basically you're saying that 
this whole PR campaign based around ISIS being very powerful, very militant, very influential in the region, which of course is making many, even in the West, go and travel to join ISIS. We've seen many stories about that. The result of that now is people flying through airports in Britain and other countries on the way to America. They're being harassed more and more because of what, as he said, seems to be a PR campaign on behalf of the Western media that in fact is it's, bolstering it's, ISIS to a level which it otherwise wouldn't achieve. Is that correct? They said that they told us only a few weeks ago that ISIS was going to be in Baghdad in a week and Baghdad is about to fall, I believe I, I read in some media. And yeah, ISIS is strong, but it's certainly not as strong as they're making it out to be. It's certainly not invincible. And uh, yeah, I think that the the groups that get the most attention are usually the groups that grow the largest also. So given what we know about ISIS, is their takeover of Iraq really a failure of US foreign policy as it's being characterized? Or did, you know, did it take Washington by surprise? Or is there another a wider agenda behind its growth? I, I don't believe it is uh, against the US agenda. I, I don't believe it was unplanned or unpredicted. I know that you know, on the surface, a lot of people think that the ISIS takeover of Iraq appears to humiliate U.S. foreign policy in the short term. Oh, they failed to create a stable, viable Iraq, and now this is this these uh, militias are taking it over. But in reality, um, this was all by design. Anyone who is observant during the U.S. Uh, occupation of Iraq, even though the media was claiming that the U.S. was trying to build a viable state and wanted to end any kind of sectarianism. Everything that they did was to push, divide and conquer and to put pit Shias and Sunnis against each other. They, of course, helped the Dawa party of uh, the, Ira the Iraqi Shias, which is a more re of a religious party ra rather than a secular party, to get into power and, of course, with their unholy alliance with Iran. Um, al-Baghdadi, the current leader of ISIS, was actually released from Iraqi prison in 2009. Um, in Basra, some British troops were caught dressed up as Arabs, these are special forces troops, um, dressed up as Arabs and shooting at Iraqi police. James Steele, General, General Petraeus and Robert Ford, they all conducted openly the El Salvador option in Iraq. They created these death squads like the battle brigades and they trained them in torture. And then those militias actually joined the interior ministry of the Iraqi government. The torture that they committed was actually exposed to the people. These groups are sectarian Shia groups that went around cutting off heads of Sunnis who just so happened to not like the Iraqi government or the occupation. So they created all this hatred and this tension. And in the meantime, the other flip side of that coin was they created ISIS and helped it grow alongside Saudi Arabia. And so any sort of um, nationality that existed in Iraq in 2004 where Shias and Sunnis were protesting against the occupation and I remember at the time Fox News, um, excuse my language, said the Shiites have hit the fan. Any sort of unity by in 2004 was crushed and it was turned into a solely... Sunni Shia war, and the end objective is to turn Iraq into three states, a Kurdish north, a Sunni center, and a Shia south. And the exact same balkanization strategy is playing out in Syria, a Kurdish north, a Alawite uh, coast, and a Sunni center. So this is the idea is to create a perpetual war between states divided along religious lines without any nationalist uh, cultural and historical connection. On, on this subject of, of balkanization, you know, given the relative success, security and prosperity of the Kurdish area of Iraq post-2003, some would see balkanization as a good option for the Iraqi people. I mean, why is that not the case in your view? Well, balkanization, as we saw with Pakistan and when it was uh, cut off India, basically resulted in a perpetual war. I mean, it resulted in an arms race, it resulted in uh, Hindus burning Muslims alive and Muslims uh, attacking Hindus, and you know, the hatred just just built up from there. And It was because of external forces. I mean, India was, was won before 
the the occupation and, and the divide. Um, it's balkanizing these countries is not an end towards the beginning of war with the Kurds. Uh, well, with with the anyone apart from the Kurds, you know, the the only thing that would divide them would be slight religious affiliations that um, have no basis in culture or history or national or re real nationality. The Kurds do have an opinion of their own nationality, but the circumstances by which uh, a Kurdistan might occur cannot be at the expense of weak nations, or at, and it cannot be at, um, cannot be unreasonable either. There are lands that the Kurds lay claim to that do not historically belong to them, and just they just happen to be oil rich. I mean, I think that uh, Israel wants a ally in the region, and that's why they kind of want a Kurdistan as well. But Turkey, if you notice is not the one that's being destabilized, it's, it, even though it has the largest population of Kurds. Balkanization, if you're a nationalist, um, it is not a solution. Now, turning to Syria itself, which of course is where ISIS really got their power in the first place, you of course were very accurate last year when you predicted the false flag chemical weapons attack, which would be used to justify the attack on Syria. That was derailed at the last minute. Then we had the MIT report and others come out confirming that, you know, the narrative that Assad was behind the Ghouta attack was basically complete nonsense. There was no evidence for it. In terms of the ISIS crisis, do you think that this is going to be hijacked by NATO, by the US, as a pretext for a second bite at the cherry when it comes to an assault on Syria? Well, if you do recall specifically what I did say on inf to Infowars at the time, was that after the chemical weapons attack, the U.S. were not uh, the U.S. military government state apparatus were not going to attack Syria. They were going to use it as an attempt to disarm them of chemical weapons. The reason that I thought there's a possibility that an attack could happen was I didn't expect Syria to actually agree to disarm. So I was thinking that might may result in a regional war, but I did uh, believe not believe that the U.S. really ever intended to attack Syria, as I repeated many times, um, at the time it was too strong, just, be, just because of the WMDs and the anti-air missiles and, and, the, and, the, and its allies, of course. But um, that's exactly what happened. And now I guess I have to repeat a little bit that um, the U.S. may intervene a little bit in terms of ISIS. I think Potentially, they'll have drones flying over Iraqi skies, and they hope to have fl drones flying over Syrian skies as well. But like with Pakistan, um, they don't actually ever want to inf defeat these uh, extremist groups. They just want to uh, keep, keep things going just enough to maintain instability and have their foot in the door. So I don't think that uh, we're going to see the U.S. have a full-blown um, invasion again. But uh, that does not going to stop the U.S. Uh, government from killing people with drones. Right. So, again, it goes back to this idea of needing instability, needing tension in the region, which is why, you know, the, the global war on terror needs a steady supply of terrorists to justify it, to justify the military industrial complex, the sales of all those weapons. And that's precisely what ISIS is providing at the moment. Obama recently announced that the U.S. would be sending $500 million to so-called moderate rebels in Syria. We've heard that many times before. But given that the U.S. actually trained ISIS members in Jordan in 2012, can we really trust the White House's judgment on who it considers to be, quote, moderate? It's really interesting because Obama himself recently told the media that the idea of a the exact quote, the idea of a ready moderate force that we can arm, that can have any chance of defeating the Syrian government, is a fantasy. So why is he dropping half a billion dollars onto a fantasy? So we can safely say that they're not ignorant of the fact that there is no uh, moderate force that has any sort of influence. Uh, ignorance isn't driving US policy. They know where the money is going to end up. They know that the moderate rebels will either defect to ISIS and take the money with them, or that they will be killed and the money is going to be pocketed by us anyway, or it's going to go into the hands of corrupt individuals, which is, you know, neither happens a lot, but um, 
the interesting thing though that even if uh the money and training doesn't ha- end up in the hands of ISIS due to defection the these moderate rebel groups that they're talking about the only existing ones um are led by a man called Jamal Ma'roof who recently told the independent that al qaeda is not his problem it's america's problem and he's has no problem with al qaeda because he's fighting alongside it the jabhat al-nusra faction which the media seems to very conveniently now forget so these moderate rebels might have some kind of uh, territorial dispute with isis but that's not stopping them from fighting alongside the other faction of al qaeda although isis are supposedly fighting with Al-Qaeda now, but there doesn't stop them from fighting along Jabhat al-Nusra, aka Al-Qaeda, and that's who the 500, that's who the 500 million dollars is going to. In, in reality, on the ground, the, the most powerful groups in Syria are ISIS, Jabhat al-Nusra, and Ahrar al-Sham, and all of them are Al-Qaeda factions. The leftovers are only taking sides of either one of these groups. And of course, many of these so-called moderate rebels as far back as 18 months ago, we had stories that they were all defecting, pledging allegiance to Jabhat al-Nusra. So even if, you know, the money and the arms goes to the moderate rebels in the first place, they can later defect as they have done. And then, you know, you've got stinger missiles in the hands of these radical jihadists. Moving on to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. This is the salt of the earth militant jihadist who likes to wear flashy Rolex watches. He recently announced that the birth of a global Islamic caliphate in the aftermath of this ISIS takeover of Iraq. What's the real story behind this caliphate? Is, is it a genuine threat? And uh, how does it play into this idea of a clash of civilizations that we've heard so much about from the neocons? Um, well, basically what ISIS really want, what they stand for, is that they they have a strange belief that God is is a real estate agent and they join other extremist factions of other religions for example during the Crusades Christianity went through something like that and in more recent years um, Ju- Judaism went through something like that with the Zionism where they think that they have a right to other people's land because of, of, of what their religion tells them a Pakistani living in London believes himself to have more claim over Syrian land than a Christian or Muslim Syrian who was born of that land and whose ancestors go back to that land for tens of thousands of years. Um, Basically, if that Pakistani in London has this belief that ISIS has, that all of this land is Islamic land and it belongs to the true Muslims, not to anybody else. So the rest can just, you know, get sunk into the sea or get shot, it doesn't matter. Um, but anybody that isn't Syrian, you know, they have a right to live in Syria. So currently the caliphate that they're declaring are contained within countries that already have a majority of Muslims uh, living in it. However, and also some that were part of the Umayyad dynasty of hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But eventually they intend to take the whole world and that might lead to problems for the UK and and Europe, more so than just terrorism, you might have people saying, well, you know, South London is now part of the Islamic State. You know, so... The, is the, that the likely, moderate... though? I mean, is it, are they powerful enough to pull that off, or is it all just fear-mongering? <laughs> no, I don't think they're par- that powerful, but that is... Uh, they're not powerful enough to pull it off, but they're stupid enough to believe it to be powerful enough to pull off. Hmm. And, which is... Now they, even now they they think they're taking over the world. They think this is, this is it. You know, this is the rise of the, the the Islamic empire that isn't Islamic in any way. In fact, it's Wahhabi to the core, which is a relatively new um, cult that emerged only a hundred years ago um, in Islam. That was an answer to the very uh, very very um, esoteric Sufism. And these Wahhabis actually, they take everything to the literal of things that aren't even in the Quran, but a separate book called the Hadith, which is 
a, a, a mixture of things that people thought that they heard the Prophet say. So some of these things are completely contradictory. But that's why you get things like they cut people's hands off for stealing or, you know, they, it, it's a kickback to thousands and thousands of years ago. This used to be a standard practice around the world that thieves get their hand cut off, but they're taking us back to, you know, the they're taking us back to thousand, a thousand years ago, really, hundreds of years ago. So um, I did want to say, though, that the moderate rebels may not want to create an Islamic state around the entire globe, but they do want to create an Islamic state, not an Islamic state, let's say, let's be more true, a Wahhabi state inside Syria and Iraq. And the, these moderate rebels, you notice that the media uses the word moderate because they cannot use the word secular because these groups are in no way secular it's, and it's clear to that anybody can see. So they use the word moderate, you know, moderate relative to Al-Qaeda and Wahhabi deranged lunatics. But these moderates, you know, are the same ones that eat hearts and chop up heads anyway, but that doesn't matter. If the U.S. really, if the U.S. government genuinely wants to defeat ISIS, they wouldn't be trying to destabilize and weaken the Syrian and Iraqi state and military. These destabilizations and the border being porous and Turkey allowing ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra in, and Turkey recently took Jabhat al-Nusra off the anti-terror list, and Turkey is a NATO member, so it does take orders from the United States. If the U.S. was serious about defeating ISIS, they wouldn't be destabilizing Syria and Iraq. They would be strengthening them, and they wouldn't be allowing Turkey and the, the neighboring states to, to boost these groups. Just something that sprang to mind when you mentioned chopping people's hands off. Of course, we posted many stories on Infowars about all the atrocities committed, not only by ISIS, but by these other rebel groups, Jabal al-Nusra, etc. And <laughs> a lot of the comments usually along the lines of, you know, kill all Muslims. As a Muslim, how do you feel when people react to seeing these atrocities committed by extremist groups and then making them somehow representative of all Muslims? Well, I think it's, it's the basically the most um, ignorant reaction anyone can make. Because the people who are suffering from these groups are Muslims. They're Muslims like me, Muslims like uh, my friend's parents who are very religious and very conservative and, and, and very, very good. And th these are the people who have been suffering the most. It's not, it's not the West. So for, for them to just turn around and say, kill all Muslims, you know, what have we done to you? We're already being killed by these groups that the U.S. government is supporting. The, this cult never existed in the Middle East before. It's, it's now, it's a growing thing, and uh, it's Muslims that have been dying the most and suffering the most from all of these events, I think. Okay, just wrapping it up with ISIS. I mean, in a couple of sentences, what is the truth about ISIS that we're not hearing in the mainstream narrative? In a couple of sentences, yeah. ISIS is backed by the United States and its allies Qatar and Saudi Arabia. We're talking about governments, not people. And if the people knew, they would not accept it. Um, and it's just a cause to destabilize, divide and conquer these lands that unfortunately seem to have a lot of resources, but not enough power to, to just defend their own borders. Okay, we're going to wrap it up there. Tell people where they can reach you on Twitter. Um, you can reach me on Twitter at Partisan Girl, and you can reach me on YouTube as well at Syrian Girl Partisan. I'm Paul Joseph Watson for Infowars.com. Syrian Girl, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much. <laughs>